Chapter One of Sailing Alone Around the World. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Alan Chant. Sailing Alone Around the World by Joshua Slocum. This book was dedicated to the one who said, the spray will come back. Chapter 1 Consisting of A Blue Nose Ancestry with Yankee Proclivities Youthful Fondness for the Sea Master of the Ship Northern Light Loss of the Aquid Neck Return Home from Brazil in the Canoe Liberdade The Gift of a Ship the rebuilding of the spray, conundrums in regard to finance and caulking, the launching of the spray. In the fair land of Nova Scotia, a maritime province, there is a ridge called North Mountain, overlooking the Bay of Fundy on one side, and the fertile Annapolis Valley on the other. On the northern slope of the range grows the hardy spruce tree, well adapted for ship timbers, of which many vessels of all classes have been built. The people of this coast, hardy, robust, and strong, are disposed to compete in the world's commerce, and it is nothing against the master mariner if the birthplace mentioned on his certificate be Nova Scotia. I was born in a cold spot, on coldest North Mountain, on a cold February the 20th, though I am a citizen of the United States, a naturalised Yankee, if it may be said that Nova Scotians are not Yankees in the truest sense of the word. On both sides my family were sailors, and if any slocum should be found not seafaring, he would show at least an inclination to whittle models of boat and contemplate voyages. My father was the sort of man who, if wrecked on a desolate island, would find his way home if he had a jackknife and could find a tree. He was a good judge of a boat, but the old clay farm which some calamity made his was an anchor to him. He was not afraid of a capful of wind, and he never took a back seat at a camp meeting or a good old-fashioned revival. As for myself, the wonderful sea charmed me from the first. At the age of eight I had already been afloat along with other boys on the bay, with chances greatly in favour of being drowned. When a lad I filled the important post of cook on a fishing schooner, but I was not long in the galley, for the crew mutinied at the appearance of my first duff and chucked me out before I had a chance to shine as a culinary artist. The next step towards the goal of happiness found me before the mast in a full-rigged ship bound on a foreign voyage. Thus I came over the bows, and not in through the cabin windows, to the command of a ship. My best command was that of the magnificent ship Northern Light, of which I was part owner. I had a right to be proud of her, for at that time, in the eighties, she was the finest American sailing vessel afloat. Afterwards I owned and sailed the Aquidneck, a little bark which of all man's handiwork seemed to me the nearest to perfection of beauty, and which in speed, when the wind blew, asked no favours of steamers. I had been nearly twenty years a shipmaster when I quit her deck on the coast of Brazil, where she was wrecked. My home voyage to New York with my family was made in the canoe Liberdade, without accident. My voyages were all foreign. I sailed as freighter and trader principally to China, Australia, and Japan, and among the Spice Islands. Mine was not the sort of life to make one long to coil up one's ropes on land, the customs and ways of which I had finally almost forgotten. And so, when times for freighters got bad, as at last they did, and I tried to quit the sea, what was there for an old sailor to do? I was born in the breezes and I had studied the sea as perhaps few men have studied it, neglecting all else. Next in attractiveness after seafaring came shipbuilding. 
I longed to be master of both professions, and in a small way in time I accomplished my desire. From the decks of stout ships in the worst gales I had made calculations as to the size and sort of ship safest for all weathers and all seas. Thus the voyage which I am now to narrate was a natural outcome, not only of my love of adventure, but of my lifelong experience. One midwinter day in 1892, in Boston, where I had been cast up from old ocean, so to speak, a year or two before, I was cogitating whether I should apply for a command, and again eat my bread and butter on the sea, or go to work at the shipyard, when I met an old acquaintance, a whaling captain, who said, "'Come to Fairhaven, and I'll give you a ship. But,' he added, "'she wants some repairs.' The captain's terms, when fully explained, were more than satisfactory to me. They included all the assistance I would require to fit the craft for sea. I was only too glad to accept, for I had already found that I could not obtain work in the shipyard without first paying fifty dollars to a society, and as for a ship to command, there were not enough ships to go round. Nearly all our tall vessels had been cut down for coal barges, and were being ignominiously towed by the nose from port to port, while many worthy captains addressed themselves to sailors' snug harbour. The next day I landed at Fairhaven, opposite New Bedford, and found that my friend had something of a joke on me. For seven years the joke had been on him. The ship proved to be a very antiquated sloop called the Spray, which the neighbours declared had been built in the year one. She was affectionately propped up in a field, some distance from salt water, and was covered with canvas. The people of Fair Haven, I hardly need say, are thrifty and observant. For seven years they had asked, I wonder what Captain Eben Pierce is going to do with the old spray. The day I appeared there was a buzz at the gossip exchange, at last someone had come and was actually at work on the old spray. Breaking her up, I suppose? No, going to rebuild her. Great was the amazement. Will it pay was the question which for a year or more I answered by declaring that I would make it pay. My axe felled a stout oak tree nearby for a keel, and Farmer Howard, for a small sum of money, hauled in this and enough timbers for the frame of the new vessel. I rigged a steam-box and a pot for a boiler. The timbers for ribs, being straight saplings, were dressed and steamed till supple, and then bent over a log where they were secured till set. Something tangible appeared every day to show for my labour, and the neighbours made the work sociable. It was a great day in the spray shipyard, when her new stern was set up and fastened to the new keel. Whaling captains came from far to survey it. With one voice they pronounced it A-1, and in their opinion fit to smash ice. The oldest captain shook my hand warmly when the breast-hooks were put in, declaring that he could see no reason why the spray should not cut in bowhead yet off the coast of Greenland. The much-esteemed stem-piece was from the butt of the smartest kind of a pasture oak. It afterwards split a coral patch in two at the Keeling Islands, and did not receive a blemish. Better timber for a ship than pasture white oak never grew. The breast hooks, as well as all the ribs, were of this wood, and were steamed and bent into shape as required. It was hard upon March when I began work in earnest. The weather was cold. Still there were plenty of inspectors to back me with advice. When a whaling captain hove in sight, I just rested on my ads a while, and gammed with him. New Bedford, the home of whaling captains, is connected with Fairhaven by a bridge, and the walking is good. They never worked along up to the shipyard too often for me. It was the charming tales about Arctic whaling that inspired me to put a double set of breast-hooks in the spray, that she might shunt ice. 
the seasons came quickly while I worked. Hardly were the ribs of the sloop up before apple-trees were in bloom. Then the daisies and the cherries came soon after. Close by the place where the old spray had now dissolved rested the ashes of John Cook, a reverent pilgrim father. So the new spray rose from hallowed ground. From the deck of the new craft I could put out my hand and pick cherries that grew over the little grave. The planks of the new vessel which I soon came to put on were of Georgia pine an inch and a half thick. The operation of putting them on was tedious, but when on the caulking was easy. The outward edges stood slightly open to receive the caulking, but the inner edges were so close that I could not see daylight between them. All the butts were fastened by through-bolts, with screw-nuts tightening them to the timbers, so that there would be no complaint from them. Many bolts with screw-nuts were used in other parts of the construction, in all about a thousand. It was my purpose to make my vessel stout and strong. Now, it is a law in Lloyd's that the Jane repaired all out of the old until she is entirely new, is still the Jane. The spray changed her being so gradually that it is hard to say at what point the old died or the new took birth. And it was no matter. The bulwarks I built up of white oak stanchions fourteen inches high, and covered with seven-eighths inch white pine. These stanchions, mortised through a two-inch covering board, I caulked with thin cedar wedges. They have remained perfectly tight ever since. The deck I made of one and a half inch by three inch white pine spiked to beams six by six inches of yellow or Georgia pine placed three feet apart. The deck enclosures were one over the aperture of the main hatch six feet by six feet for a cooking galley and a trunk further aft about ten feet by twelve for a cabin. Both of these rose about three feet above the deck, and were sunk sufficiently into the hold to afford headroom. In the spaces along the sides of the cabin, under the deck, I arranged a berth to sleep in, and shelves for small storage, not forgetting a place for the medicine chest. In the midship hold, that is, the space between cabin and galley under the deck, was room for provision of water, salt beef, etc., ample for many months. The hull of my vessel now being put together as strongly as wood and iron could make her, and the various rooms partitioned off, I set about caulking ship. Grave fears were entertained by some that at this point I should fail. I myself gave some thought to the advisability of a professional caulker. The very first blow I struck on the cotton with the caulking iron, which I thought was right, many others thought wrong. "'It'll crawl!' cried a man from Marion, passing with a basket of clams on his back. "'It'll crawl!' cried another from West Island, when he saw me driving cotton into the seams. Bruno simply wagged his tail. Even Mr. Ben Jay, a noted authority on whaling ships, whose mind, however, was said to totter, asked rather confidently if I did not think it would crawl. "'How fast will it crawl?' cried my old captain friend, who had been towed by many a lively sperm-whale. "'Tell us how fast,' cried he, "'that we may get into port in time.' However, I drove a thread of oakum on top of the cotton, as from the first I had intended to do. And Bruno again wagged his tail. The cotton never crawled. When the caulking was finished, two coats of copper paint were slapped on the bottom, two of white lead on the top sides and bulwarks. The rudder was then shipped and painted, and on the following day the spray was launched. As she rode at her ancient rust-eaten anchor, she sat on the water like a swan. The spray's dimensions were, when finished, thirty-six feet nine inches long overall, fourteen feet two inches wide, and four feet two inches deep in the hold, her tonnage being nine tons net, and twelve and seventy-one hundredths tons gross. 
then the mast a smart new hampshire spruce was fitted and likewise all the small appurtenances necessary for a short cruise sails were bent and away she flew with my friend captain pierce and me across buzzards bay on a trial trip all right the only thing that now worried my friends along the beach was will she pay the cost of my new vessel was five hundred and fifty three dollars sixty two cents for materials and thirteen months of my own labour i was several months more than that at fairhaven for i got work now and then on an occasional whale-ship fitting farther down the harbour and that kept me the overtime End of chapter 1 Recording by Alan Chant in Tunbridge, Kent, England www.sevenoaksprep.kent.sch.uk